We're going to apply these principles to diatomic molecules and predict major absorption lines. For diatomic molecules, both atoms are vibrating, so we must use the reduced mass when quantifying the mass of the system. After determining the reduced mass of the system, all we need is the spring constant, which is a representation of the strength of the bond between the two atoms in order to determine these spectra. Let's do two examples. The first example is, the infrared spectrum of BRF consists of an intense line at 380 inverse centimeters. Calculate the force constant K of BRF. So the first thing we need to do is we need to calculate what is the reduced mass. Because again, we've got these two atoms that are vibrating. So we've got mu is equal to, and in this case, the first mass is 75 times the atomic mass unit times 19 times the atomic mass unit, which is basically what the exponents here in front of the elements are telling us, is how many mass units are inside each of these elements. On the bottom we have 75 times the number of mass units plus 19 times the atomic mass units. So if I multiply and add these together, I get 1425 mu squared divided by 94 mu. And so I can cancel out the mu on the bottom and the squared on top. And so what I get is 1425 divided by 94. And the atomic mass unit is 1.661 times 10 to the minus 27. So that means then that the mass or the reduced mass is equal to 2.518 times 10 to the minus 26 kilograms. And so what we're going to do is we're going to plug that in to basically a change in energy relationship. Because again, we're trying to find the photon, which is either emitted or absorbed, for a transition that relates to 380 inverse centimeters. So that just means that the delta E is equal to E final minus E initial. Well, this intense line happens between the transition when n is equal to 0 to n is equal to 1. That's where the most intense line comes from, because generally things are in the ground state, and we excite it to the first excited state. So that means we, we then get h bar times k over mu square root 1 plus 1 half minus h bar k over mu times 1 half, 0 plus 1 half. And that delta E is going to be equal to the energy of the photon, which in this case, since we're given it in terms of wave numbers, then I'll write it explicitly as hc over lambda. Well, I can distribute out an h bar, k over mu, and I get 3 halves minus one half, and so I get essentially it's equal to one. And on this side I have hc times 38,000, because I want to write the, the 380 inverse centimeters in inverse meters, which again I would multiply by 100 that number, so I get 38,000. And then an inverse times a length, well here I've got one over lambda, which means then I just multiply by that number. 38,000. I'm going to do one more simplification here. I know that h bar is equal to h divided by 2 pi. k over mu times 1 half is equal to hc times 38,000. And since I've made this simplification, since I've got an h, sorry that should have been an h on that side, but since I have an h on both sides, then I can cross them off and now I can solve for k. So what I have is k divided by mu 1 half 2 pi c times 38,000. I'm going to square both sides and multiply it by mu, which means that my k is equal to 4 pi squared c squared times 38,000 squared times mu, which was 2.518 times 10 to the minus 26.
So then my force constant is going to be equal to 129 newton meters or newtons per meter. All right, so then that leads us to our second example. In this case, we're given the force constant of a chlorine gas molecule. And in this case, it's 319 newtons per meter. And so what we're supposed to calculate is the fundamental vibrational frequency and the zero point energy of this molecule. So first of all, I'm going to calculate the reduced mass. In this case, it's going to be 35 mass units times 35 mass units divided by 35 mass units plus 35 mass units. That gives me 1,225 MUs divided by 70, sorry, and that would be MU squared, divided by 70 MUs. In that case, the square cancels out with the number on the bottom. And so that gives me 1225 times 70 times the mass of a mass unit of an atomic mass unit, 1.661 times 10 to the minus 27. And so that's equal to 2.91 times 10 to the minus 26 kilograms. And so then in this case, now we're going to calculate the frequency. That's the first thing we'll do. And so we'll say the change in energy, which has to do with that photon. Again, this is final minus initial. And that in the end is going to be equal to h nu. So we'll say h nu is equal to, well, ef is equal to h bar times k over mu, one half, one plus one half, because that's the energy of the first excited state. And from that, I'm going to subtract off h bar times k over mu raised to the power of one half. 0 plus 1 half. And there's the fundamental. Again, I can simplify in a couple of ways. The first is I'm going to distribute out all of these constants. So I have this h bar times k over mu times the square root of those two things, and I have that same term again here. I'm also going to change this h bar into h over 2 pi. h over 2 pi, k over mu, one half, and what I have is one plus a half is three halves, minus one half, zero plus one half is one half, and so that's just going to give me one. I can also cross off my h bars, and so I have a direct statement that tells me the frequency of this photon, one over two pi, k in this case is 319, mu I just calculated, 2.91 times 10 to the minus 26. And that's enclosed in a square root. 3 half minus 1 half is 1. That means the frequency is equal to 1.667 times 10 to the 13 hertz. Now the second thing I asked for was what is the energy of the ground state? or in this case they call it the zero point energy, which is another word for the ground state energy. That is essentially this term right here, where we're going to find the energy of the ground state. So that means that E naught is going to be equal to h bar k over mu one half times one half. Because again, zero plus one half is one half. E naught is equal to, well, h bar squared is equal to 1.055 times 10 to the minus 34. K again is 319, and that's divided by mu, which is 2.91 times 10 to the minus 26. That's to the power of 1 half. And I can write my 2 out front right there. When I plug these numbers into my calculator, then I get E naught is equal to 5.52 times 10 to the minus 21 joules. More generally, for larger molecules, it is important to note that not all vibrations are visible to infrared probes. Vibrations where there is no change to the dipole moment of the molecule are invisible. In this example, with the CO2 molecule, only the modes that change the dipole moment, the bending, and asymmetric stretch are visible. 
Up until now, we have also only focused on the harmonic potential. A better representation of reality is the anharmonic potential. This potential better mimics the possibility of breaking the bond by going to zero for high L. This is not described in the harmonic potential since it is a parabola that goes to infinity on both ends. While the anharmonic potential is a more accurate picture of reality, the harmonic potential shares very similar energy levels at the bottom of the potential. Thus, when molecules are close to the ground state, the harmonic potential can typically be used as an appropriate substitute. To summarize this lecture, the simple harmonic oscillator uses a parabolic potential to trap the particle in a well. Using this potential in the Schrodinger equation is difficult to solve explicitly. We instead used raising and lowering operators to define and solve a first order differential equation for the ground state of the wave function. Again, quantization of energy, this time of the oscillation of atoms, naturally occurred. Active infrared modes are vibrations which modify the dipole moment of the particle. And finally, the anharmonic potential is a more accurate picture of reality. However, when the particle is close to the ground state, both models are typically very close.